Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we can come together to worship you, and we pray that the spirit of truth will teach us. You have given us wonderful words. You have given us your teachings and commands. And Lord, what we want to do is to know and obey. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, for those of you who have been with us since August this year, we've been preaching and learning through the eight core values of Central Baptist Church, and we think these are important uh, for our church and for everyone who worships and uh, serves together here in this church. And then, for the months of October and November. Um, We've been taking eight Sundays to thoroughly learn more about how to live as Christians and how our lives may be transformed. And this, of course, is the first of our core values that we want to uh, really consider and ponder uh, deeply and in details to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. And so, I want you. To go back to Colossians chapter three and verse nine, where Paul says we are to put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, in the image of its creator. And of course, we all know that、um, the transformation of our mind and our hearts and our spirits—that's the will of God. And so, the ultimate aim of every Christian on earth is to be Christ-like. So we'll be renewed in the knowledge, in the image of our God. And so the key to be Christ-like—that's the key word. And in John chapter 14, just two chapters before the passage that we have just read, Paul says, "If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit." Of truth, and so once again, part of what we are as Christians is to love God and to obey all that our Lord Jesus has commanded us to do, and that is the goal of Christians on earth. And Jesus said, "Love me and obey me." So these are the key words: love God. And obey him. And so, if you want to describe the life change or the transformation that we hope for and aim at, this again are the key words: love God and obey Him. And then, of course, it would come to the million-dollar question, as we say. Of course, in our spiritual lives, it can never be quantified. But anyway, the question is. Well, we know this is the goal, but how? How will this come true in my life? How will I be transformed to be like Christ? How will I have love for God and obey all that He has commanded me to do? We know that this is what God wants to see in your life and in mine. But how will this come about? And I firmly believe that the answer is the Holy Spirit. And that is why we're talking about the spirit of truth today. And next Sunday, we'll go on to learn more about the Holy Spirit. Now, many of us know that the topic of the Holy Spirit is like a hot potato. Often, there is misunderstanding about the Holy Spirit. Truly, we all believe in the Trinity. We believe that the Holy Spirit is God, the third person in the Godhead. But often, it's so abstract. Some Christians talk about the Holy Spirit just like it's an, a pronoun or a substitute word for God and for Lord. Well, we understand that the Holy Spirit brings glory to God the Father and God the Son, and He doesn't draw too much attention to Himself. But this doesn't mean that we are to neglect Him. And then, on the other extreme, some Christians go too far in emphasizing the work of the Holy Spirit, and they come up with all sorts of interesting interpretations and all sorts of interesting behaviors. So it's difficult. 
But as humans, we all know that we are limited. And we are often stuck in seeing the way in only one way and forget that we can be led to different viewings. There's a story about a wealthy oil baron. He once commissioned Picasso to paint a portrait of his wife. And when the work was completed, the baron was shocked to see the image that had been created. And he said, why? Why that looks nothing like my wife? You should have painted her the way she really is. Picasso took a deep breath and said, I'm not sure what that would be. The oil baron pulled out his wallet and showed a photograph of his wife. There you see, this is the picture of how she really is. And Picasso bent it over, took a look, and he asked, do you want me to paint her the way she looks in this photo? The guy said, yes, exactly as she looks in this photo. And Picasso replied, she is rather small and flat. Do you really want me to paint her exactly like that? Well, the point is, the man was so wrapped up in his own view of his wife, he could not understand anyone else's view of her. And we have to admit that our intellect is so limited that we struggle to understand the Trinity. And for too long and too many of us just neglected the Holy Spirit. And you know, Albert Einstein, one of the reasons why he said he could not become a Christian was that he couldn't figure out the Trinity. He just can't understand it. For, for him as a scientist, he thinks he has to understand everything. But he just can't. So my point this morning is, we can't just keep on neglecting who the Holy Spirit is. Because the Holy Spirit is the third person of God. And God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Of course, like I said, this is a difficult topic. But today I would want to start talking about the Holy Spirit, learning about the Holy Spirit together, by putting forth five reasons why we must learn about the Holy Spirit. We can't just keep on using the Holy Spirit as a pronoun of God. First reason, Jesus left and he sent the Holy Spirit to you and he said it is for your own good. That's in John chapter 16 and verse 7. He said, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go... I will send him to you. Jesus left. And then he sent the Holy Spirit to you. And he said, it is for your good. He's even saying that it's far better for you to have the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes we really wish that we could actually see Jesus. We would touch him. We can hear him preach. But Jesus said, no, it's better for you that I'm gone. And it's far better for you to have the Holy Spirit. And as a pastor, as a teacher, it's my responsibility. And as a church, it is our responsibility to bring to you all the good that Jesus has prepared for you. Do you want to miss the good that God has in store for you? He said this is for your good. And thank God we can receive it. The second reason why we must learn about the Holy Spirit. Because our understanding of the Trinitarian God will be defective if our knowledge of the Holy Spirit is inadequate. John 14 and verse 16. Two chapters before the passage that we have just read. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. So even in chapter 14, Jesus has already foreshadowed this. And John actually spent a few chapters 
in the book of John, in the Gospel of John, to teach us to record what Jesus has said about the Holy Spirit. And the word another, another counselor. Jesus said he would give you another counselor. The word another here is a very special word. It means another one which is of the same nature. It's not like, I don't like this plan. I want another one. Give me another plan. So it will be a different plan. But this word another is more like when you had a slice of cheesecake. Wow, it's so yummy. I really want another piece of this cheesecake. And what you're saying is that you want another piece of the same cheesecake. Because this cheesecake is the yummy cheesecake that you want. And it's also like a piece of dark chocolate. I like dark chocolate. I don't know whether you like dark chocolate or, or white chocolate or whatever chocolate. This dark chocolate, it's so good. I want another one. And this another one must taste the same as the one that I just had. It's the same one. And so when Jesus said, I'll give you another counselor, it's God. It's the same God, but it's the Holy Spirit. It's not a different God. It's the same one. So we believe that the three persons of the Trinity, we describe them as co-equal, co-glorious. And that means we must know the Holy Spirit the same way that we know God the Father and God the Son. Otherwise, our understanding of God of, God, of, of who God is will be defective. And as a result of that, as a result of neglecting and not knowing the third person of the Trinitarian God, it means that at the most we can only understand two-thirds of who God really is. Of course, once again, we not quantify, we cannot quantify our understanding of God. But just a, a sort of a general description, if you don't know about the Holy Spirit, you only know about two-thirds of, of, of who God is, God the Father and God the Son. And so, if our knowledge of God is defective, and if we do not learn enough about the Holy Spirit, we would have lost at least one-third of the work of God in our lives, and one-third of the blessings that God has given in your life. This is the third reason why we must learn about the Holy Spirit. Now you say, well, this is theology. I don't study theology. I don't even know what theology means. <laughs> well, theology simply means the study of God, that's all. Well, you guys go to the Bible college, and theology is for Bible colleges. Theology is for pastors. But theology is not just for the Bible college. Theology is not just for pastors. Our actions and our behaviors are always determined by our beliefs. What you believe determines how would you live, what will you do. And so theology means that our knowledge and our beliefs about who God is and what he does and says are all interrelated. So what you believe about the Holy Spirit determines what, will you, what, what, what you would do and how you would live and whether you will be transformed by the Holy Spirit. If you don't know about the Holy Spirit, well, the Holy Spirit can always work in mysterious ways but that means you would lose a lot of his work. And then the fourth reason. Why must we learn about the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. John has repeatedly recorded what Jesus has taught us in, 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 in uh, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16. John has repeated it. So once again, chapter 14, verse 26. The Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things 
and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So this is one way the Holy Spirit teaches us the truth. Because he is the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth will remind you and help you to understand all that Jesus has taught while he was on earth and as it is recorded in the Bible. That's what the verse says. Read it again. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, the Counselor, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that Jesus has said. So that's how the Spirit of Truth will teach us. Sometimes we can be so forgetful. The Holy Spirit reminds you that Jesus has said that. And sometimes we're not just forgetful of what Jesus has said. We're forgetful of where my Bible is. Where did I put my Bible? Um, well, that was maybe two weeks ago, three weeks ago, four months ago. I haven't read my Bible. Where did I put it? I can't even find it. Well, someone needs to remind you. And then you forgot what Jesus said. Someone has to remind you. And the Holy Spirit reminds you. The Holy Spirit will remind you of everything that Jesus has said. And so if you don't know the Holy Spirit, if you do not relate to the Holy Spirit, no one else is going to remind you of what Jesus said. The Holy Spirit wants to remind you of what Jesus said, but you have closed your ears to the, uh, to the Holy Spirit. You have closed your heart to the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is a gentle spirit. He doesn't force you to do anything. He, he would not break down your door to force himself into your heart. And then there is another way the Holy Spirit teaches us as the spirit of truth. That's in chapter 16, verse 13 to 14. The next slide says, But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by, by taking from what is mine and making known to you. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit teaches us what is yet to come. Now in the last verse, the very last verse of the Gospel of John, in chapter 21, verse 20, John said, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. And so the spirit of truth continues to teach us the truth of God. Because all that Jesus has done and all that Jesus has taught while he was on earth could not be recorded in any any large books because even the whole world cannot contain it. And so the Holy Spirit continues to teach us what we may not be able to read in the Bible. Well, but don't worry. Well, Jesus has said it very clearly and we should understand this very clearly. Everything that the Holy Spirit teaches comes from Jesus Christ. Nothing that the Holy Spirit teaches is not from Jesus Christ. So it's very clear here. Jesus said he will speak on he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And the Holy Spirit hears it from Jesus Christ. And he will tell you what is yet to come. What is yet to come doesn't mean that he would tell you what is going to happen tomorrow, whether there is going to be another super typhoon from anywhere in the world. What is yet to come is not restricted to these sorts of things. But the Holy Spirit will teach you the truth that he hears from Jesus Christ that may not have been in the Bible as it is now. But of course, all these must be from Jesus Christ. And so it's extremely important that all truths that we hear from the Holy Spirit must be in line with what Jesus has already said in the, whole, uh, 
in, in, in the Bible. There must be no contradiction. It must be perfectly in line with what Jesus has already said, as in the Bible. And so if you want to know all that Jesus has commanded, you must be in touch and in sync with the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you would not be able to know all that Jesus has commanded and then to obey him. Now, on the day of Pentecost, as recorded in Acts chapter 2, there were many Jews who understood, who saw God's new view of the world through the eye of the Spirit. But there were also many who did not understand who could not see the world around them in any other way than the way it had always been. And in that chapter, we see the fulfillment of Christ's promise to send the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit's power is unleashed like never before. It shocked the disciples who were there. It shocked the whole world. Acts 2, verses 1 to 4. On that day, there was sound like the blowing of violent wind, and they saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire that came to rest on every person in that room. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, and the Spirit enabled them. And then Peter preached a powerful sermon, and 3,000 people repented and surrendered their lives to Christ. And they devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles. And the Bible continues, continues on to say that the apostles performed miracles. They met every day in homes as well as in the temple courts. They broke bread and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They shared what they had with those who did not have. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will do that too. When we are all filled with the Holy Spirit, we'll all do that together too. Of course, we may not hear the sound of the violent wind unless there is a typhoon. We may not see the tongues of fire. We may not speak in tongues. But we're going to experience the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, making us more and more like Jesus Christ. And we'll have the power to obey His commands as in the Bible. We'll have the strength to testify to His great power of transforming our lives. We will experience it together. But you have to know the Holy Spirit. You have to be in sync with the Holy Spirit. You have to open your lives and allow the Holy Spirit to come upon you, to fill you and to guide you. Well, sometimes it still sounds a bit abstract. Well, I've never done that before. I've never seen that before. I don't know what it really is. Well, as it recorded in Acts chapter 2, it's almost 2,000 years ago. And like well, we were saying, we, we, we do not have to speak in tongues. We do not see tongues of fire come upon us. So what is it, what's it really like? Do you know what goes through the mind of a caterpillar? Well, I bet you don't, because I don't. Someone describes it in, in, in this way. For all of a caterpillar's life, it crawls around on the ground and maybe up and down some plants and shrubs. And then one day, this caterpillar felt a bit tired. And so the caterpillar said to itself, I'll take a nap. I'll take a nap. And it was a long nap. And then, what in the world would go through its head when it wakes up and it discovers that it can fly? And the caterpillar said, I can fly! What do you think the caterpillar would think when it sees its tiny new body with the gorgeous wings? This is the kind of astonishment and excitement that we would experience when the Holy Spirit enters and fills our lives. We would be stunned in disbelief over becoming a new creation with the Holy Spirit living in us. 
Sometimes we have not truly experienced what, what, what Jesus said. If you're in Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. A new creation. What does that mean? Sometimes we simply think, oh, I'm going to become a good person gradually. So I will become a new creation. But Jesus is saying much more than that. Paul is saying much more than that. A new creation. The Holy Spirit fills you and makes you a new creation much the same way as the caterpillar becomes a butterfly. And so to experience this and to be in touch with the Holy Spirit, to be in sync with the Holy Spirit, it is not enough just to know the Holy Spirit in an intellectual way. Because knowing God and knowing the Holy Spirit has to be an experiential knowledge rather than intellectual knowledge. Do you know the word know? Well, we all know the word know, right? I'm saying the word know, K-N-O-W, know. We all know this word know because we know. But do you know that in the Bible, the word know really means to be involved intimately. Do you know that's why the Bible uses the word know when Adam knows Eve? Well, does Adam know Eve? Well, of course, Adam knows Eve. But when the Bible says Adam knows Eve, he's talking about an intimate relationship, an intimate involvement in marriage, in unity, spiritually and physically. And so to know God and to know the Holy Spirit is not just to read a book about the Holy Spirit. It's not just to listen to a sermon about the Holy Spirit but really to talk to the Holy Spirit. Do you talk, do you, do you talk to God the Father? Yes, you do. Do you talk to God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, you do. And so you must talk to the Holy Spirit too. You have to have this intimate relationship and intimate involvement with the Holy Spirit. And so the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you because it's the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. And this Spirit of God lives in you. You know, when we describe the resurrection, we say Jesus was raised from the dead. We don't usually say Jesus raised himself from the dead. Did you think about that? The, the, the Bible doesn't say Jesus Christ raised himself from the dead. Of course, Jesus is God, and he perfectly had that power to raise himself from the dead. But the Bible often says Jesus was raised from the dead. And the Spirit of God raised him from the dead. And that same Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead raises you from the dead, gives you new life, gives you new power, and makes you a new creation. And so we should really pause for a moment to think about this. And we should really pause for a moment to pray to the Holy Spirit. And so like I said, it's not enough just to read a book or many books about the Holy Spirit. It's just... It's not enough just to listen to a sermon or even many sermons about the Holy Spirit. So I'm encouraging you, urging you, advising you. Every morning when you wake up, say good morning, say good day to the Holy Spirit. Have you ever said good day to the Holy Spirit? No? <laughs> so tomorrow morning when you wake up, try to remember this. Good day, Holy Spirit. Thanks for giving me life. Holy Spirit, come upon me afresh today. Fill me. Guide me into all truth. I want to know the truth. I want to live out the truth. Fill me with your power so that I can live for my God. Well, your prayer has to be, well, can be shorter than that or longer than that. But at least say this. Firstly, say, good day, Holy Spirit. Secondly, say, 
Thank you for giving me life. Thirdly, say, come upon me fresh today. Three things. Can you remember that? Three things. Good day, Holy Spirit. Thanks for giving me life. Come upon me today. So every day, every morning when you wake up, say this. Say this greeting to the Holy Spirit. Well, of course, we know that the Holy Spirit lives in your life the moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But, but as I said, the Holy Spirit is a very gentle spirit. The Holy Spirit never forces open your heart. He will only come in when you invite Him to. So every morning we have to affirm that invitation day by day. Believe me, you have to do that day by day. You know, for me, I don't even just do that once a day. I do that many times a day. I talk to the Holy Spirit, come upon me, Holy Spirit, guide me. When I pray, I say this. When I encounter any difficulties, I say this. Holy Spirit, come upon me. Every morning, pray this prayer. Now, like I said, um, today we'll start talking about the Holy Spirit. Next Sunday, we'll have another message, probably on the more practical side of how to be intimately involved with the Holy Spirit, how to be walking with the Holy Spirit. And I guess Pastor Ian will be doing that next Sunday, isn't it? <laughs> and it, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be exciting. But for now, like I said, we should pause for a moment and let us pray, let us talk to the Holy Spirit. Well, usually when we finish a sermon, well, the preacher would lead us to pray, but um, this, this time around, let us all pause a moment first. Let us pray individually, quietly, pray to the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit, please come upon me afresh today. Say this in your heart. Say this to God. Say this to the Holy Spirit. Father God, we thank you once again for your love for us. You have loved us so much that you sent your, Lord, your, your, your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to come to this earth to die for our sins, to redeem us. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for coming to this earth Thank you for the sacrifice of dying for us on the cross. Thank you for being our Lord and our Savior. And Lord Jesus, thank you for sending us the Holy Spirit when you return to the Father. Thank you. It's the most precious gift that you have given to us. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for accepting the mission to be sent by God the Father and God the Son. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding me into the truth. Holy Spirit, thank you for your work of regeneration in my life. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming upon me to live in me. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We ask that, Lord Jesus, your spirit will continue to guide me step by step in all that I do, in all that I say. We have seen the power of the Holy Spirit as recorded in the Bible, but we believe that the Holy Spirit can give me such power so that I will live for my God Help me, Lord. 
And as we carry on in this kind of mood of prayer, we'll sing this song, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.